You may be seated. The invitation song will be 560, Living by Faith. But there's a lifesaver on my uh, podium this morning. I'm just saying, it's, there, of all the things you get up and see, sometimes that's a first. And so I had to just share with you that first. I'm so glad that you're here today. Welcome to the Beltline Church of Christ. It's exciting to see your smiling faces. Glad that you're here in spite of the weather. One thing I've learned about Alabama's already is you guys know how to throw a good storm. Uh, we don't know about that stuff. I mean, lightning, rain all night long, two kids in the bed and kicking and all kinds of stuff. It was, it was quite an adventurous evening, so it was, it's good to be with you, though, this morning, and I'm thankful that you're here. Grab your Bibles. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6. Let's begin in verse 25. Let's hear the word of the Lord this morning. Here's what it says. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into the barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. My name is Steve Smith, and I am a worrier. I'm confessing that to you this morning. This is, this is something I struggle with. I, I, I am a worrier. I, and as I stand before you this morning, I confess that I have seen a much better way. I, I know that there's a better way out there. It's a more trusting way. It's a way that fits better with my belief that the kingdom of God is here right now. But even though I know that way and I'm seeking to follow that way, I don't always succeed at getting there. Can I get something from you on that? I mean, isn't that most of us that we kind of struggle with this a little bit? And worry, at least for me, reveals the places in my life where I have not or I am not obediently following Jesus. Worry in my life, I don't know if it's yours, my guess is it probably is, but worry reveals the places in my life where I am not obediently following Jesus Christ. I got some work to do. How about you? I believe that if I'm ever going to overcome this, if I'm ever going to be the guy guy that God wants me to be, if I'm ever going to live this carefree life, if I'm ever going to be God's guy fully, I'm going to have to learn to stay focused on Jesus. I'm going to have to learn that with all that's in me. I'm going to always have to look to him and his word for direction. I'm going to always have to look to him and, and, and his word for provision. Because if you look anywhere else, What you're doing is you're setting yourself up for worry. You're setting yourself up for anxiety. And ultimately, I believe if you look anywhere else, you're setting yourself up for failure. And so Jesus must be the rock that we build our lives upon because everything else, as we'll look at in the next lesson, is simply sinking sand. And Jesus has just revealed to us in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24, that passage that we just had read for us, it reminds us that our hearts only have room for one devotion. Did you know that about your heart? It really only has room for one devotion. And that devotion, if you're a follower of Jesus, must be God. Because he won't play second fiddle. That's just something he won't do. Our hearts have room for only one devotion, and that devotion must be God. And not only that, Jesus goes on to say that every competitor, and there are many in our lives, aren't there? Every competitor for our heart's devotion needs to be done away with, needs to be removed, needs to be hated. That's how serious God takes this, and that's what Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24 is all about. It's not Jesus plus something. You can't have Jesus plus. That's not how it works. It's not Jesus plus the law. It's not Jesus plus religion. It's not Jesus plus the world. 
You see, it's when we have these multiple masters in our lives that we find this, this, this struggle to have the abundant life that he's called us to have in John chapter 10 and verse 10. It's when we have this multiple masters that we find it hard to simply be at rest. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. We know that Jesus promises that if you come to him, we'll have rest. And it's an amazing thing, and we all desire that. But yet, these multiple masters keep us from experiencing that rest that he calls us to and that rest that he wants to be about. Our hearts have room for only one all-embracing devotion. Who is it in your life? What is it in your life? When we try to combine our love for him and love for something else, Jesus plus a nice house, Jesus plus the promotion, Jesus plus the latest fashion trend, then what happens is we end up struggling with all our loyalty to Jesus because those things have a tendency to take our attention off of what they really need to be about, and, and we struggle with that. And so it's not Jesus plus. And then when we have Jesus plus something else, we wonder why our lives have such anxiety, such worry, and such selfishness. Because what we don't recognize when we have Jesus plus is that those things are symptoms of something. And what they're symptoms of is faithlessness. Think about that for a minute. Because doesn't worry reveal the places where we're not fully trusting God? We look out for number one because we believe no one else will. If it's going to be done, finish it. I guess I'm going to have to do it, right? Isn't that the mentality that we take off? If it's going to be done, I'm going to have to do it. It's going to have to fall on my shoulder. Why do we say that? Why do we constantly look out for number one and number one only? Because we don't believe anybody else will, including Jesus. If it's going to be done, I'm going to have to do it myself. I want you to know that the people to who Jesus is writing here in Matthew chapter 6, or speaking to here in Matthew chapter 6, knew worry very, very well. The large majority of the people that Jesus was speaking to were simply trying to hammer out a meager existence in this world. They, like so many today, knew how important it was simply to receive their daily bread. They knew the signs of, of the times around them. If there wasn't enough snow in the winter, there would be a drought. If there wasn't enough rain, the food supply was in trouble. If the locusts showed up in full force, or if there was an invading armory, army, then, then might not be enough for everyone. They understood worry probably a whole lot better than we do. I mean, we live in an amazingly wealthy nation. I think the, the wealthiest in the history of the world is the United States of America. And if you were a third world citizen looking at us, people might suppose that worry has passed us by because we have so much, don't we? I mean, we are amazingly blessed. But as I look at how much we have, it doesn't seem that worry has decreased at all in the society that we live in. Because what we do, in the absence of those real worries of daily bread and those kind of things, we create stuff to worry about. We, we make up new things to worry about because in the absence of those real worries, we, we just start making stuff up because we don't know what to do with ourselves. I love, I love what Irma Bombeck said. She says it this way. She said, I've always worried a lot, and frankly, I'm good at it. I worry about introducing people and going blank when I get to my mother. <laughs> I worry about a shortage of ball bearings, a snake coming up through the kitchen drain. I worry about the world ending at midnight and getting stuck with three hours on a 24-hour cold capsule. I, wonder, I worry about getting into the Guinness Book of World Records under pregnancy, oldest recorded birth. <laughs> I worry what the dog thinks of me when she sees me coming out of the shower. <laughs> That one of my children will marry an Eskimo who will set me adrift on an iceberg when I can no longer feed myself. I worry about sales ladies following me in the fitting rooms, oil slicks and Carol Channing going bald. I worry about scientists, and this is my worry as well, I worry about scientists discovering someday that lettuce has been fattening all along. <laughs> what are the things that you worry about in your life? What do you worry about? Many of us, we do have some struggles. We, 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 some of us here do worry about daily bread and, and food and shelter over our head. But, but for other of us, uh, those worries have long passed us by and we worry about other things. Maybe it's finances, how we're going to make it to the next car payment. Maybe it's juggling bills. Some of you are still trying to stretch a Social Security check that hasn't increased in the last 20 years. And you're wondering, how's this going to work out? How's this all going to come together? Some of you are worried about death. Will it be soon? Will it be distant? Will it come in a car? Will it come in a plane? Will it come in an ICU ward? 
What are your worries? What are the things that take away your sleep at night? What are the things that cause you to say, "Mm, what if? And isn't that the biggest thing that we think about? What if? I drive myself crazy with the what ifs. Well, what if this happens? And what if that happens? And then if that happens, then I got to do this. And if that happens, and we just go bonkers with that. I love what one French philosopher said. He said it this way. My life has been full of misfortunes, most of which never happened. (laughs) He's right. My life has been full of misfortunes, most of which have never happened. Or as someone else once said, worry is interest paid for trouble before it's due. Worry is faith in the negative. It's trust in the unpleasant. It's assurance of disaster. It's belief of defeat. That's what worry really is. (coughs) So, excuse me. (coughs) So Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 begins with this word, therefore. If you underline in your Bible, you want to circle, you want to underline, you want to do something with that word, because that word, therefore, is a very important word. It should be like a big neon arrow pointing us backwards, because that's what's going on here in Matthew chapter 6. This arrow is pointing back, and what Jesus is saying is, because of what I just told you, What I just told you regarding masters, remember you can't serve God in money, you can't serve God in riches, remember what I just told you about masters, your hearts only have room for devotion to one. He says, remember what I said, and since I'm urging you to trust God, therefore, because you can't serve two masters, I'm telling you don't worry. that's, That's kind of the context of what's going on here, and it's these words that guide us through the rest of chapter 6. I want you to notice, however, that in the course of the reading, Jesus never says that we shouldn't be concerned. Jesus never says that we shouldn't show precaution. Some people take this verse and they misunderstand it and they think we've got to be so totally laid back that we can never take precaution in anything. It's just going to be happy-go-lucky, easy-going guy, but that's not what Jesus has in mind here. It's not that we go without fire alarms. It's not that we leave our doors unlocked. But Jesus is saying there's a big difference, a humongous difference between healthy precaution and unhealthy worry. And so Jesus continues in verse 25 by reminding us that isn't life more important than these necessities that we have to have? Isn't life more important than food? Isn't the body more important than clothes? And then he uses the illustration of a bird. Now, I'm not much of a bird person, but my family has become bird people lately. We have little bird stuff set up in the back that squirrels eat, and it's kind of interesting. But my kids, especially as we've started homeschooling, have been looking at a bird every, every week. There's a new bird. And so they can tell you uh, the design of all of these birds. They know the difference between robins and finches and red birds and crazy birds and all kinds. I can't tell you anything about it. But the life of a bird is really, really interesting. The bird simply goes about its business, doesn't it? The bird isn't nearly as energetic as you or I are in producing food, does it? I mean, he doesn't doesn't go build barns or anything like that. He's not overwhelmed by sowing and reaping like we happen to be from time to time. Now, does that mean the bird doesn't work for his food? Of course not. The bird doesn't wake up one morning and say, Okay, God, drop one in right here. Drop a worm. I'm ready. (laughs) <laughs> the bird doesn't do that. That's not the way the bird works. He's, he, he does his job. He scratches. He digs because God has programmed that bird to go after food, but he doesn't get all uptight about it like we often do. Listen to this poem. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why those anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, well, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. Ooh. Those birds are smart. Or if you don't like that one, how about this one? There was a young lady from Ride who got carried away with the tide. A man-eating shark was heard to remark, I knew the Lord would provide. I, I don't know... I don't know which one you like better, but both of them are kind of saying the same thing. And so Jesus says, and he asks a very important question. He says, guys, guys... Aren't you more important than a bird? Aren't you of more value than a bird? And if it's true that God takes care of these little things, then how much more is he going to take care of your life? How much more is he going to take care of my life? And then Jesus proceeds to highlight the absolute craziness of worry. He says, listen, how many of you can add an hour to your life by worrying about it? 
<laughs> you ever thought about that? I can take hours away, but I can't add anything to my life. I, how many of you can grow an inch taller? My wife hasn't tried this one yet because maybe she'd be like 5'6 instead of 4'11. But how many of you can worry yourself into being taller? It's crazy. Worriness is crazy, but yet we do it all the time. What kind of doctor who had a patient with heart disease would suggest that they go ahead and take a month off of work and go worry about it for a while? It doesn't make any sense. We wouldn't, we wouldn't do that. Worry never changes a C to an A. It never changes a malignant to a benign tumor. Worry doesn't do anything like that, does it? So what worries are you carrying around this morning? You see, these words are not just for those disciples and those apostles in the first century. Those, these words are for everyone who seeks righteousness from the inside out, and I'm hoping today that that's us. And I don't know about you, but do you see how plain Jesus makes this? He says worry is wrong, and doesn't that make worry a sin? Or at very least, can't we say that worry doesn't fit the life of one who believes that God is indeed reigning and that God is indeed on his throne? Can we at least say that? That that is not consistent with, with the life of a Christian. But, but at the same time, I need you to understand that, that these words don't come from someone who is a harsh judge looking to fire something at us, looking to condemn us because we worry. No, these are words that come from someone who loves his people and wants to free them up from living a life that's full of worry. That's the God that we serve. And so he yells us there are three problems with worries. Here's the first problem. Number one, worry focuses on the wrong things, doesn't it? I worry focuses on the wrong things. I can't help but remember the story in Luke 10 of Mary and Martha. There's Martha in the kitchen trying to get everything just right for Jesus' visit. And she's worrying herself into a frenzy. She's anxious. Well, what is that? Mary, Mary's not helping me. What's going on? Where is she? And there's Mary at the feet of Jesus studying, listening, and talking, and engaging. And, and, and Jesus says, Martha... Don't you understand? You're, you're worried. You're anxious about many things. But there's really only one thing that's the most important. And, and Mary's chosen that, Martha. And I'm not going to take that from her. I sure hope you'll choose that next time, Martha. Worry, worry focuses on the wrong things. Number two, worry is inconsistent. It just is, especially for those of us who are Christians. Who made man? Who is responsible for you having a body? Who filled your body with life? Now, if God was able to do that, don't you think he's also going to give you the things that you need to keep your body going? But you see, the problem is we think we need all these other things on top of the provision that God provides, and so we get ourselves in a little bit of trouble. Because I can't just be satisfied with the three-bedroom house with it's just me by myself. i got to have the 5,000, whatever. You know, we, we, we drive ourselves crazy thinking we need things that we don't really need. Worry is inconsistent. It focuses on the wrong thing. Number three, Worry is useless. If you take nothing else from the lesson today, take that. That's what I'm trying to take from it today. I try to remind myself on a regular basis, this doesn't change anything. Why are you still worried about it? What are you doing up at 2 in the morning worrying about something that you don't even know is going to happen? Worry is useless. It doesn't change anything. In fact, it actually works against us. It hurts us physically with our health, and it shows a watching world that our trust is not fully on God. So what I want to do for the rest of the lesson, I want to talk about ways we can conquer this. Because I don't want to live this way anymore. How about you? Can I get something from somebody today that doesn't want to live this way anymore? I don't want to live this way anymore. And I think there are some very practical steps that God gives us here that we can do if we're going to conquer worry. Now, while the power is with God, we've got to decide whether or not we're going to be eaten away with worry or not. So here's the first thing that we have to do if we're ever going to conquer this bad boy. And here's the first thing we have to do. We have got to let God provide. We've got to let God provide. If God takes such good care of the birds and flowers, surely he knows what he, we need and he will take care of us too. Because listen, this is important. He is creator to the birds. He is creator to the flowers. But he is father to us. Are you with me? He is father to us. 
And and surely our God, who knows what we need as an amazing father, is going to take care of us. And Jesus says, listen, the, the Gentiles, those pagan people, they're the ones that are chasing all of these things. They run convinced that everything falls on their shoulders. And so Jesus is trying to tell us it's just as pagan to worry as it is to worship a false god. Ooh, that's a slap in my face. But to his followers, Jesus is saying, guys, what do you do with your worries? What do you do with your worries? Do you drink them away? Do you stew in them? Do you keep putting them all into your system until eventually your body's just going to explode? No. Jesus says, let me provide. Jesus says, I want you to invite your turn to turn your worries over to God. In Philippians chapter 4, there's this amazing section of Scripture. This is one I know well. Growing up, my mom and dad had this on the, on the mirror. They must have struggled with it like I do. Every time I'd walk into their bathroom, there it was, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, looking at me, one I've committed to memory, but I'm going to read it so I don't mess it up. Here's what it says. Be anxious for nothing. Philippians 4, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be known to God. And listen to verse 7. And the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts through Christ Jesus. This section of the lesson basically says look around at how God provides. Look at how he takes care of this world and now believe that he's going to do the same thing for you. The real question is are we going to trust him or are we going to keep trying to do it ourselves? As I understand the promises of God, He doesn't say that he'll remove every obstacle. He doesn't say he'll remove all our pressures. But what he does promise is he offers to be present with us and to help us bear those problems and those hardships when they come. And it's just as much the blessing of God to offer his presence as it is to deliver us if you know who God is. And so the first thing we need to do is we need to let God provide. And what that means is We've got to be content with the things that we have. You see, we could carry on there in Philippians 4, and we could talk all about contentment, but that's another lesson for another time. Because it's when we're not content that we find ourselves worrying about stuff that we don't really need or stuff that we don't have. Here's number two. Second thing we need to do. We need to pursue God's rule. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. We sang it earlier. Matthew 6, 33 says to us what? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and God will take care of everything else. In a nutshell, that's the Steve version of Matthew 6.33. God's going to take care of everything else. You see, our calling is a positive calling. You see, our calling is not just to avoid bitterness and to avoid lust and to avoid dishonesty. We should do that. But we have a positive calling to seek God, to find our joy in Him, to listen to His voice, to find rest in His presence. And when we do that, when we pursue that positive calling, then all of those other things, bitterness, lust, those kind of things that we've talked about are going to become less and less and less and less in our lives. But only if we are pursuing God's rule first. Seek first the kingdom. It's not a happy leftover. That's, that's one of the things that drove me crazy about California, is that it seemed like church was just, eh, if I don't have anything else going, maybe I'll go to church. And California's not the only place that struggles with that. Can I get something from you on that? If I have piano recital, I'll go to that. If I have, if I have baseball practice or a baseball game, I'll go to that. If I have you know, a good game on TV, I'm going to go stay and watch that. It's not that big a deal, you know. God knows my heart, (laughs) and he does. But I'm saying, man, shouldn't our actions and our attitudes follow what we say? And if we're really going to pursue God's rule, then wouldn't that be the first and foremost thing in my life in everything that I do? Listen to this prayer. I'm going to change the language a little bit because it's one of those old-timey ones with these and thous and all kinds of stuff, and I just like it better new. So here it goes. Father in heaven, what is man without you? What is all that he knows, vast accumulation though it be, but a chipped fragment if he doesn't know you? What is all his striving? Could it even encompass the world, but a half-finished work if he doesn't know you? You, the one who are one thing and who are all things. So, may you give to the intellect wisdom to comprehend that one thing. To the heart, sincerity to receive this understanding. To the will, purity that wills one thing. 
In prosperity, may you grant perseverance to will one thing. In suffering, patience to will one thing. Oh, give both the beginning and the completion. May you, early at the dawn of the day, give the young man the resolution to will that one thing. And as the day wanes, may you give to the old man a a renewed remembrance of his first resolution, that the first may be like the last, and the last like the first in the possession of a life that has willed that one thing. Alas, but this has indeed not come to pass. Something has come in between. The separation of sin lies in between. And so each day and day after day, something is being placed in between. Delay, blockage, interruptions, delusions, corruption. So in this time of repentance, may you give the courage again to will one thing. What is that one thing? He said it in the prayer. Let me say it again. That one thing is seeking God and His rule first. And that prayer is all about God. Help us see that that is the most important pursuit of life. More than anything else that's out there, let us seek you first. More than the promotion, more than the job, more than the scholarship, more than whatever it is. Let me just seek you first. And everything else will take care of itself. Pursue God's rule. Number three, finally. We need to negotiate one day at a time. Negotiate one day at a time. We're ever going to conquer worry. We've got to negotiate one day at a time. Matthew 6, 34 says, Do not be anxious for tomorrow. Tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Some translators say, Take no thought for tomorrow. But that's not really what Jesus is saying here. He didn't mean that taking out an insurance policy or thinking about tomorrow is wrong. What he means is don't worry about it. Precaution, yes. Consideration, yes. But worry, no. Just live one day at a time. And I love how the verse ends. <laughs> Each day has enough trouble of its own. Don't worry about tomorrow. You're going to be lucky to get through today, he says. So, so just stop worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow. At the end of World War II, the Allies opened up some camps for orphans. They worked hard to restore a sense of security in these children. But in one particular camp, they experienced a problem. Their children would not sleep. They would put them to bed, they would turn out the lights, but sleep would not come, even though the kids were exhausted. And so the camp directors brought in some psychologists who recommended that every night before they tuck the children into bed, that they give them a piece of bread that they could put in their hands. And once they did that, the kids began sleeping through the night. Even though they were well fed at this camp, their experience had taught them that there might not be food tomorrow. And so, with a piece of bread in their hands, they could sleep, assured that at least when they woke up the next day, there would still be something to eat. And my question for you today is, what is in your hand? What is that little piece of bread in your hand? Jesus says it is a knowledge. What we should hold in our hands is a knowledge that there is a Father who cares intimately and deeply about you sitting here today. That is the knowledge that we should take with us everywhere we go. We have a Father who loves us. And when you go to bed at night, you have in the palm of your hand a kind assurance that God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never abandon you. Now let me ask you, how would your life change if you asked God to teach you this every day? How would your life change if you asked God to teach you not to worry? What if your daily prayer was, God, keep me focused on this until I find and finally obediently trusting in you? How would your life change? You see, to not worry means to trust Jesus, to trust him. He is for you. Let me stress that again. He is for you. He is not against you. He's never been against you. He wants you with him. And he is furiously pursuing you to that end. John 14 verse 1. Don't worry. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Some versions say you trust in God. Trust also in me. And when we really trust God, when we really believe in his provisions, then he's going to free us up in ways that we have never possibly imagined. And when we're freed up in ways that we haven't imagined, we're going to be able to do some amazing things because we know that God is for us. We know that God has our backs. We know that he is on our side. So never forget, never forget that God is for you. 
Never forget that. If you take, again, nothing else with that, remember, he is for you. He's not against you. He is with you. He longs to have you at his side. He longs to be, to be your God and to be your father in every way, shape, form, and fashion of the world, word. The question is, are you going to let him be that? Are you going to let him do that? Are you going to trust him with your life? If you've trusted him with your salvation, can't you trust him with your life? That's a great question. Wow, I wish I would have thought of that earlier. If you can trust him with your salvation, can't you also trust him with your life? I hope that you can. If you're here today and you haven't trusted him for your salvation, I want to encourage you to do that right now today. Come believing, repenting, confessing, and getting to the waters of baptism where God removes our sins and applies that grace and mercy to our lives so that we don't have to worry about things anymore because we know that no matter what happens in this life, that we have a future that's secure with him. If you just need the prayers, if you're like me, a constant worrier, and something's just got a hold of you right now, then come, let us pray for you. Let us help you through this. Let us be the family of God that we've been called to be. If we can help you at all, we want to invite you to come while together we stand and we sing this song for your encouragement. I cannot today.